The reading is from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. That's Isaiah 52, 13, to 53, 12. That's on page four, sorry, 741 of the Church Bible, 741. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his figure was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness, so he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was there, nor was there any, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, He will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Father, your word tells us the prophets like Isaiah spoke of the grace that was to come to us and searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Messiah and the glories that would follow. And we ask that by that same spirit now, you would give us a deeper appreciation of the sufferings of the Christ. And give us an appreciation of all the glories that flow from his death and resurrection. This we ask in his name. Amen. Well, by any reckoning, Isaiah 53 is one of the most famous chapters in the whole Bible. And I think it's it's easy to see why. You see, it answers one of the great questions that humanity faces. It answers one of the deepest longings of the human soul. That question is, how can we get rid of guilt? How can we escape the displeasure and condemnation of God? You see, God's ancient people, Israel, had a problem. It's a problem we all share. They were going into exile because of their sin. They had rebelled and they were going to be judged. 
But God wonderfully has promised that he's going to bring them back. Chapter 52, verse 10, the strong arm of the Lord is going to rescue. And he was going to bring them back and wanted them to be pure and blameless before him as they were rescued. But that leaves a huge question. How was their sin going to be dealt with? How could their past record be dealt with? How could their present sinfulness be dealt with? You see, that's a huge question for us. How can our sin be dealt with? The vocabulary of sin in this passage is worth noting. It doesn't use the sin word. It speaks there, you can see it in verse 5, of trespasses and uh, iniquities. Iniquity. The word means crooked, to be twisted. You see, we by nature are not straight. We are not what we should be. We are distorted. And a trespass is not simply to break a rule. It is to break faith. It is to betray. We have trespassed against God. We have betrayed him as humans made in his image. We were meant to live in a way and we rejected his ways. And we break agreements and we break agreements in the horizontal as well. We have the trespass and the iniquity problem. We are sinners if we are honest. And so, as Chris has been reminding us, that these verses tell us we're like sheep who in some sense have wandered off, going their own way. And this matters. These iniquities, these trespass, the being like sheep matters because God is real. He is offended Others are damaged, and he is a holy judge. But do you recognize that lost sheepness in yourself, in your own personal history? Can you recognize yourself? Do you, in your heart of hearts, want to pray these words? Can we just put those up on the screen for a moment? Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your, thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. Can you say those things and know those things? Shall we say them together? Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. How can we be made clean? How can this problem of sin be taken away? We can see it. How could Israel be made acceptable to God? That was the question which now needs answering. And Isaiah 53 at long last in Isaiah gives us the answer for how God can comfort his people and deal with them and pronounce them forgiven. And this morning what I want to do with you is simply to look, to look. That's what uh, verse um, 13 tells us to do of uh, chapter 52. See, behold, look. What we're going to do for these few moments is simply, as those who know that they are lost sheep, to look at the servants, to focus our attention on him. This famous section, which Joe's just read to us from Isaiah 52 and 53, is made up of five sections. I just want to pause with each of these five sections and look at them as Isaiah kind of develops an argument as we look at the servant together, at God's great servant. This servant has already been introduced to us in Isaiah 
the servant who would have the spirit appoint, uh, poured out on him, the spirit, the servant who would rescue the nations. Well, let's have a look at this servant now as we think about the sin problem. And these five sections, they're just all th- the three verses here, three verses each. The first section is the end of chapter 52, those three verses there, 13, 14, and 15. And we see there that the servants will be exalted and successful. Sections one matches sections five in this chapter, this section. The servant, first you will see, will be exalted and successful. There in verse 13, see my servant will act wisely. Or it could be will act, will be successful. He will prosper. He will be raised up and lifted up and highly exalted. There's confidence here that the servant to come will succeed. Many of us will have had the builders in at various stages. We had an extension put onto our house about 20 years ago. We had a builder, a wonderful man called Pat. But you'll know that situation with builders. We kind of wondered whether it was ever going to happen. Was he ever going to deliver? There seemed to be so many factors outside of his control. Well, he did actually in the end. But here we can be confident that this servant will succeed. He will do the great job that he's given to do. And having succeeded, he will be exalted. Now this word exalted is used five or six times in Isaiah. And there's only one person in Isaiah who is exalted and that is God himself. And here the servant is going to be lifted up and exalted. Successful and exalted. All across France, 23 people are being exalted this morning. They came yesterday and they did a demolition job on the English. And they are being exalted. Well, this servant has an even bigger job. And he will be exalted. He will be successful. But these introductory verses tell us not only will he be exalted and successful, but at times there's going to be a state in this journey where it doesn't look like things are going well. That his appearance is disfigured. He's not going to look like a success at some great point in all of this. And in fact, it looks like the wise ones, the kings, won't think much of him, but they will come round. And his name will be made right across the nations. He will do something for the nations. So that's the great introductory verses. He will be successful. He will be exalted, this servant. He won't necessarily be seen to be great at various points, but in the end, all will see that he is great. So we move into chapter 3 for our second section. And we see here in these first three verses that the servant appeared to many to be unimportant, unimpressive, inconsequential. See, it asks the question, who has believed our message and to whom has the Lord of the arm been revealed? It sense here that God's going to do a salvation, but actually a whole lot of people won't believe, at least for a period. And he picks up on his themes all being introduced. There didn't seem to be much to him. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. When you get a little root out of dry ground, particularly in the Middle East, you're not very optimistic. It's going to grow a little bit and it's not going to do much. You know, often when you have a group of people, there's the ones that stand out. You teachers will occasionally, won't you, have a brilliant pupil and you'll say, yeah, they're going to go far. Or on the football field, you'll see a young lad or a young woman and you'll say, yeah, they are fantastic. But not this man. Not from the right family, not from the right school, not from the right area. Wasn't very promising. And then later in life, when it looked like he was starting a new movement... 
it all went so badly wrong. He ended up suffering. He ended up in pain. He ended up being hated. It looked like a complete failure. So at the end of verse 3, we held him in low esteem. We didn't think much of him. It's interesting the word we, we didn't think much of him. It's almost now these people are tracking this we as those who can track their own unbelief. We looked at him and we didn't believe. We've come to see now, but we didn't think much either. He would be exalted and successful, but things didn't look promising. In fact, he suffered pain and rejection. Then we move on to the third section as we look at this servant's. And it's a central section of this great chapter. And Chris has already showed those verses to us. And it's been wonderful to reflect on them and have more time to reflect on them. We see here in this central section that the servant suffered for our sins. You see, what did the people who didn't believe think when they saw the suffering of the servant? What were they thinking as they saw this suffering servant? Well, what did they think? Verse 4, it tells us, We considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. When they looked at the sufferings of the servant, they said, Oh, yeah. He's suffering because he must have done terrible things wrong and God is rejecting him. He must have lived a terrible life or there's something deeply wrong with him. You know, that can often be our first thought about people. They're suffering. Ooh, I wonder what they did. It happened with Job in the Old Testament. He suffered terribly. All his friends come around. Well, what did you do wrong? What did you do wrong? So they assumed with this servant that his sufferings and his pain were all being caused by his own sin. But they've come to see, the we have come to see something else. It wasn't because of his own sin that he was suffering. Why was he suffering? Verse 4, he surely, they've seen it clearly now, he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and he expands on this idea that he took up our pain, but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. He wasn't suffering for his own sin, he was taking our pain, He was taking our sufferings. He was taking our punishments. He was pierced, and he literally was pierced, for our iniquities. He was suffering for us. He was punished in our place. Penal substitution, taking the penalty in our place that we might have peace. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. By his wounds we are healed. Isn't that a beautiful thing? By his wounds we are healed. When a surgeon operates on you, he inflicts a wound on you to heal you. This saviour takes the wound in himself for your healing. And what is this peace? What is this peace? And I think it's the central idea that he, by, he, he gives us this peace there in verse 5. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Well, you need to come back. Because Isaiah 54 and 55 are all about the peace that flows from the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. It includes a free pardon. It includes life with God. It's about a wonderful future that this servant secures. Verse 6 sums this little section up. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him 
the iniquity of, the, of us all. The Lord, God himself, Yahweh, has put onto this servant our sin. It's picking up here, I think, the idea that we see in Leviticus 16 on the Day of Atonement, which was the great day in Israel when sin was dealt with, although, of course, it was only foreshadowing. The animals could never fully deal with the sin. And there was a lot of blood on that day. There was a lot of death on that day. Bulls, goats was killed. But of the, of the two goats, yes, one was killed, but one, the sins of Israel were laid onto the goats. And the goat was sense. There was death. There was laying of sins. There was saying, sending away. And here the picture is the Lord himself lays onto the servants our sin. To be taken away. To be dealt with. Your sin, Richard. Your sin, Luke. Your sin, Ben. Your sin, Murray taken and put on him. The fourth section, verses seven to nine, the servant was willing to die and was fully innocent. You see, we're left with the question, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all to rescue the sheep. God was behind this. But what about the servants? What did he think of this? Was he forced into this? Well, this little section tells us. There was no protest from him. There was no protest from anyone, in fact, he wouldn't say a word, verse 7. He did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the shearers. He did not open it. He wouldn't try and stop it. He knew it was his destiny. He knew that this is what he'd come to do. He wanted to go this route. And it's also absolutely clear in these verses that although he was executed with criminals, he was completely innocent. Verse 9. He had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. There was no deceit. You see, he wasn't full of uh, iniquity. He wasn't twisted. He always spoke the truth. He'd done no violence. There was no trespass. There was no rebellion in him. All of those things that we are, he was not. And you know, when we go to the Gospels, we see the way that this prophecy was just worked out so perfectly. We see Jesus Christ going willingly to his death. In fact, you can almost say organizing his death. He walked into Jerusalem to embrace that danger. He knew his hour had come. He handed himself over in the garden. He could have so easily have got rid of that arrest party. He offered no defense when he was accused. He was silently and obediently, willingly, taking on that death. Although he was innocent. The Gospels make it absolutely clear, I think, particularly Luke's Gospel, that he had done absolutely nothing wrong. Like a man taken into police custody, picked up and arrested. He gets to the police station, they interview, they collect the evidence, they realize they have absolutely nothing. And they say, sorry sir, off you go. Well, that's what Pilate tried to do. There's nothing here. It, of course, was the bang of the crowd and the weakness. He handed this innocent man over to be crucified. You get the picture here as we go through this chapter. The successful, exalted servant. The one who looked like he was nothing. But the one who actually came to die for our sin. The one who willingly took this on. Who was fully innocent. And so to our final section, verses uh, 10 to 12. 
the servant will be raised and exalted and save many. There, verses 10 to 12. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. It was all God's plan. But what will happen? Well, we see here, I think, resurrection. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. He's he's going to be successful. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. The picture here is of God causing this, it being delighted uh, with uh, the servant. There's going to be a prolonging of his days. There's going to be, he's going to be successful, this servant. And he's going to be raised. He's going to see the light of life. And the servant himself will be satisfied. He will see the light of life and be satisfied. He's going to be, in one sense, delighted with his own work. If I can bore you with my own medical history here, when I had my operation, the next morning one of the doctors came round. It was one of the was number two doctor, not the main consultant, to tell me it had all gone well and that the consultant was delighted. He'd gone to the early morning meeting to say how pleased he was and to show everyone what he'd done. Didn't come tell me all that, but he went and showed all his colleagues. He was delighted with it. Satisfied with the job he'd done. And here we have one who is satisfied in the job he's done. And what is the great work he has done? We see it there again in these verses. By his knowledge, by what he's done, by who he is, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. For he bore at the end of verse um, 12 the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. The servant came to die for us, was raised again, and is satisfied, is pleased uh, with the great work he has done in saving men and women, in dealing with their sin through his substitutionary penal death. He came willingly to do it. He was effective. He did his work well. All this, of course, is about the Lord Jesus Christ and his great work on the cross for us, his glorious resurrection. It's a prophecy telling us exactly what he would do. So as we work towards a close, as we ponder this, Let me just share three reflections with you for you to take away. Firstly, God does for us in Jesus Christ what we could never do for ourselves. God does for us in Jesus Christ what we could never do for ourselves. We have the sin problem whether we see it or not. We have all gone astray like lost sheep. We know that, the true story of our lives. We give one narrative our lives, but the true narrative of our life, if we are honest before God and before others, is not so pretty. And we know that that should have consequences, and before God it does. How can we escape those consequences? How can we escape the judgment to come? How can we be expected by God, accepted by God? Well, God does for us in Jesus Christ what we could never do for ourselves. God comes in Christ to take our sin and to bear our penalty. Any number of little stories could illustrate that. And you'll see things in the news. You'll have a father who jumps into a river to save his daughter. She's drowning, she's powerless, she's going. He goes in, he goes in as the relative. He goes in with one final push. He pushes her up to safety, but in doing that, he goes down to his own death. 
So it is with Christ. He does for us what we could never do for ourselves in this great rescue. If you have not yet looked to Jesus Christ to deal with your guilt, to deal with your sin, please come to him this morning. Look to him and say, yes, I have sins. Please forgive me. And I trust in the forgiveness that you provide. If you are a believer, already know again that he has completed the work of dealing with your sin. He really has. He's dealt with it. His mission was successful. You are justified. You have been forgiven. Know that again this morning. God is delighted to call you his child and loves you. The barrier has been removed. Nothing can separate you from his love because of the death of Christ. Second little area of reflection. Don't be surprised that people don't get it. Don't be surprised that people don't get it. It's a big theme of this section. They couldn't understand what was going on. He looked like a failure. A crucified man from the backwaters of the Roman Empire does not look like a very promising thing. And it doesn't sound like a very promising message for our world. They didn't get it then, and often they don't get it now. You see, Paul will write, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. He goes on in 1 Corinthians to speak about uh, how... uh, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. This message of a crucified Messiah is to many just foolishness at so many levels. But we know that this message, that this Savior, is our salvation. And hang in there with people. Because this we, here in this chapter, went from those who didn't believe, who didn't understand, to people who did understand. And I think Paul actually is exploring that in 1 Corinthians 2. How do you go from it appearing foolishness to recognizing that the cross is the wisdom of God? It is through the work of the Spirit. So hang in there with people. Many won't get it. But some slowly will, just as you have. Final reflection. Sing. Sing. You see, in verse 13 of 52, we're told to look. Look at the servants. But once you've looked, chapter 54, verse 1, what are you to do? Sing. Sing, because of this glorious salvation that he has won for us. And how does John in the book of Revelation, as he opens up heaven to us, and we get a picture of the throne room of God, what is happening there? They sang their Revelation 5, a new song. Who to? Well, listen. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you have purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. In a loud voice, it goes on to say, they were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Let's pray. Father, we are sinners by nature and sinners by choice. We are fallen sons and daughters of Adam. 
we are rebels. And pure justice would mean that we just receive condemnation, eternal condemnation. But we thank you for your mercy and your grace and your great loving plan of salvation. We thank you that in eternity past you purposed to save a people for yourself. We thank you that you purposed the Lord Jesus Christ to come into this world to save a ruined people. And we thank you for that great work on the cross. We thank you for all that this chapter tells us of the way that you laid upon him the iniquity of us all, that he was pierced for our transgressions. We thank you for that great saving work which he willingly embraced. And we thank you it was an effective work that he and you are satisfied with that work. And we thank you that we are included and cleansed as we believe in Christ. And we thank you for all that flows from that. So Lord, as we conclude, would you fill our hearts with joy? Would you fill our hearts with confidence in the sacrificial death of Christ? Give us that fresh sense that our sins indeed have been forgiven and removed. And that nothing can separate us from the love that you have and fill our hearts with joy as we sing the praises of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. When the musicians are ready, let's stand and sing of our wonderful Savior.
worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Amen.